Welcome. This is January 13th, 2020. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And today we are going to start uh, our listening as to how things are going on in our in our schools. Um, and I just wanted to, to start this with uh, acknowledgement that there is a tribe in Africa called the Maasai, whose traditional greeting to each other is Kasarian and Gary. And it means, how are the children? They don't ask each other, how are you? But rather ask about the next generation. And they actually believe that monitoring the well-being of their children is the best way to determine the future health and prosperity of their whole society. And with that in mind, we are very anxious to hear from you. How are things going in this period of COVID? And in there, we will also want to hear, are there some things that we in the legislature um, can do uh, to, to help? Are there, are there things that are barriers for you um, that we might have some, some uh, influence over? And um, I would like to start with um, superintendent. We're hearing from the superintendents uh, now, later, we will get an update from the principals, and later in the week, we will hear from the teachers and the school board members um, and the uh, guidance counselors. So I'm really looking forward to this week informing us um, as to what you're seeing from your perspective. So I'd like to start with David Yon, superintendent of Mill River Unified Union School District. And welcome, David Yon. Uh, happy Good to morning. see you here. Good morning. Thank you, Representative Webb. I, I appreciate that. Um, Appreciate being here this morning. I know a few of you personally. I'm looking forward to getting to know the rest of you over the course of this legislative year. And I'm grateful, as are my colleagues. I'd like to start by expressing thanks on behalf of all my colleagues for inviting us to share our perspectives and experiences with you today. My name is Dave Yelms. I serve as the superintendent of the Mill River Unified Union School District in Rutland County. I'm also honored to represent my colleagues as the president of the Vermont Superintendents Association. VSA is an organization that represents and supports more than 50 superintendents and advocates for sound educational policy decisions in order to best serve and meet the needs of students and educators. VSA is very well served by the leadership of Executive Director Jeff Francis and Associate Executive Director Chelsea Myers, who are both with us in this meeting today. VSA is organized into five regional groups, Southeast Vermont, Southwest Vermont, Winooski Valley, Northeast Kingdom, and Champlain Valley. These groups meet regularly during COVID-19, sometimes multiple times per week, to identify regional and statewide needs and provide collegial support. It won't surprise you that during the last 10 months, that support has been more important than ever before. As you're aware, Vermont superintendents serve as the statutory CEOs of complex organizations in a state that cherishes local control and decision-making while faced with the need to address challenges, both educational and fiscal, on a statewide level. Under normal circumstances, the role of the superintendent is extremely and incredibly challenging. In the pandemic, those challenges are exponentially multiplied. The need for consistent leadership and wise decision-making during the pandemic era has stretched some systems and leaders in ways that may be hard to recover from. Throughout this period, superintendents have collectively filled the gap between statewide directives and policies and the intricacies of local implementation. Superintendents have navigated constantly changing conditions and guidance with grace and skill. Prominent issues continually encountered by superintendents include, first, safely operating school systems during the pandemic while ensuring that as many students as possible have access to in-person instruction and adhering to complex and sometimes restrictive guidelines that limit those opportunities. Second, identifying, responding to, and exercising influence on policy decisions and directives that might negatively impact school communities. Third, managing school finances and budget development in complicated, austere times, despite the challenges that are faced at the local and state level. And fourth, attending as a first priority to the safety, educational, and social emotional needs of students and school staff. Much of the success that has occurred in Vermont can be attributed to the integrity and fidelity with which school districts and SUs have met and exceeded expectations. It is my belief that the systems that did the work of merger under Act 46 
found themselves far better positioned to navigate the pandemic and its ramifications. Through clear channels created by mergers as related to safety, continuity of learning, managing student and staff needs, and serving as a consistent and predictable support to the broader community, it is my belief that school operations in COVID-19 in a pre-Act 46 environment would have been significantly more chaotic, fractured, and potentially deadly. I realize that those are strong words. I say them because I mean them. As we continue to survive the pandemic and its effects, the state is logically turning to contemplating a recovery plan. It will be critical that any such planning and, and expectations around that planning and the products of it be rooted in reality, useful to the organizations doing the work, achievable, and reflective of the many complex aspects involved with schools, people, and the global crises that have affect all of our lives. Ultimately, it is my hope and wish that the General Assembly does more than just understand the impressive work that superintendents have collaboratively accomplished with the support of boards, staff, and communities. It is my hope that the General Assembly recognizes that the best expression of support for school districts at this time does not take the form of new ideas and new initiatives. It takes the form of time and space. Time and space to lead through the remainder of the pandemic. Time and space to complete implementation of significant legislation already in place. Time and space to take care of kids, staff members, and communities. And finally, time and space to finish a good work started. Vermont is full of people who seek to do the right things for the right reasons. And our schools are but a microcosm of that cultural reality. I wish to thank you for providing us with the opportunity to deliver on our promises to meet and exceed your expectations and to contribute ably to Vermont, to its recovery and to its future success. I thank you for letting me share with you this morning. And at this point, I'd like to turn over to my colleague and friend, Jean Collins from Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union. I just want to, um, to committee members, let's uh, hold our questions. Um, and I'd like to get through all of the superintendents. Um, it, and it just remind superintendents um, also to just be careful of, of jargon, which you did not use, David Yance, but just a reminder that some of our members are new to this topic and, and to just be careful of our letters. <laughs> so thank you. And Superintendent Jeannie Collins, welcome back to the Education Committee. Thank you, Representative Webb, and I'm happy to be here with you all. And I actually have room to spread out my arms as opposed to being squished into a little chair. That's unusual. Um, so I am Jean Collins. I am the, um, I'm in my seventh year as superintendent in the Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union, which consists of two merged districts, Barstow Unified and Otter Valley Unified. Um, and we serve eight towns in those two districts. Um, like everyone, we have worked very hard to have a strong reopening plan that keeps staff and students safe and healthy and moving forward. We did a phased in opening back in the fall and it took us about four weeks to get our settled plan into place. We started with our K-1-2 kids in five mornings a week and we offered some childcare to parents um, around that time, which in hindsight, I probably would not do again because it became very difficult to staff. Um, ultimately, we have been since October, our elementary students have been in school four days a week with a remote option and about 10% of our elementary students have chosen to stay remote. On the classroom, our remote option is that the, the student actually streams into the classroom. So the teacher has a computer set up in the classroom and they are teaching remote and in-person at the same time. We do not have a separate remote academy as some of my colleagues do. Wednesday is a planning day for the teachers and students work on Edmentum Learning Path, which is um, both a diagnostic assessment tool, but also a tool that provides both uh, remediation and enrichment work for students that's designed exactly for them in kind of a video gaming format. So the kids think it's a lot of fun. We're able to get some diagnostic information and provide some skills on Wednesdays that will both remediate and enrich their learning. Um, 
Otter Valley Middle School and High School are in person two days a week, and the students stream in the other two days a week, again, with Wednesday being a planning, a full remote day. Students are given work, but the teachers are planning. And I know that sometimes people have questions, why do teachers need a full day to plan? But it is very, very difficult to teach both remotely and in person at the same time. It requires a different level of intentionality and planning so that you, you don't want a student really sitting on the computer for seven hours, especially in grade two. So you have to know exactly when to have them join you, when not, et cetera. And, and that, that is very, very time consuming. So this has been working out well. Um, about 25% of our middle school and high school students choose to stay remote. We have lost a few students to homeschooling with parents, but we may remain connected with the families as we anticipate that they will return in the fall. And we have leveraged federal dollars to purchase a Chromebook for all of our students. And we also provide a hotspot as well to families who need the internet. And we're able to cover all but a handful of families that way to access their online learning. Um, sticking with internet access, this is an area of equity that I feel really should be at the top of the state's plan. I think that um, this pandemic has really highlighted the inequities throughout the state of access to solid internet, um, not just for um, learning, but for families in general. We also will not be able to continue to provide hotspots as we move to um, in-person classes eventually. So there are many lessons learned about COVID in particular. Um, you know, last spring we pivoted in a matter of 48 hours to be a totally remote system without having provided computers and without having any training um, for the faculty, staff, or the students, to be honest. And we did a great job, but it was not a great job, meaning that we did, um, considering the circumstances, I feel that we did a wonderful job, but we also learned a lot of lessons about the intentionality of planning and, and scheduling and timing. And so we spent the summer, our staff spent the entire summer working on uh, refining our curriculum, the essential skills of our curriculum, and um, preparing for a different type of remote learning this fall. We learned that the need for parental engagement makes all the difference in student engagement. When online in particular, we learned that offering lessons remotely, as I mentioned, requires a different lens on the curriculum with a clear delineation of essential learnings. We learn that kids miss their social time and social emotional learning is more difficult to do remotely. Um, I was at a couple of the schools on the first day that kids return and they were just so excited, even with masks on, to see their teachers, to see each other. Um, I've had high school kids tell me they only come in on their two days so that they can um, access their friends in their 20 minute socially distanced lunch. So, it, you know, that, that's hugely important. We also learned that some kids thrive in an online environment while other kids do not. Just like school, uh, traditional schooling is not a one size fits all. Remote learning has opened up some opportunities for other kids. Hazing, harassment, and bullying incidents have been reduced significantly as fewer students are in school at once and remote learning is an option. Opportunities include thinking about how we can continue to be intentional about the essential learnings and offer more choices and opportunities for students using technology as we return to in-person. And personally, I would like to see a remote option continue in some way as it allows in particular some older students to meet other needs such as jobs or family issues and still be able to take classes. Um, so those are the opportunities that I'd like to identify under COVID. I'd like to take just a minute as well to talk about H48 I do understand that it passed through the house yesterday and I very much appreciate that. And I appreciate um, the, some of the pieces that were added after testimony last week. I do want everybody to understand the impact on schools, just as you talk to your colleagues, I guess I can't say in the state house, but as you talk to your colleagues, um, just so that you have an understanding of what it means for your school districts. RNESU, and that is a, an acronym, um, has eight towns which means that there are eight possible dates for voting that can occur. 
it's not likely that there will be eight different dates. Uh, my latest word is that six are gonna stick with town meeting, five or six, and two or three are considering another date. But the potential is eight different dates. Schools have a legislated timeline for our town meeting and that timeline has already begun. And by the time this makes it through the Senate and the governor and becomes official, our timeline can't change because of the legislated pieces of it. So we will be staying with um, March 2nd. Our charter calls for our votes to be commingled. So that means that if five or six of my towns vote on March 2nd and two or three vote in April or May, I won't know until April or May on whether or not I have an approved budget, which is pretty quick if I need to turn around and, and, and go back out, which is concerning to me. Um, as well, the law doesn't actually have an end deadline or the last version I saw. Um, so they, towns could choose to vote in October and schools have a deadline of June 1st for an approved budget or else you'd revert to a formula. Um, I really very much appreciate that the House put in a, a clause about towns supporting the schools in doing votes. If, if I have towns that are not doing March 2nd, it means I'm running a special election in those towns. I, I don't have personnel to do that, um, Board of Civil Authority folks, um, and our towns do. And it's really important that towns support the schools if there is a difference in date between towns and schools. So I really appreciate that you heard that and put that into the bill. And with that, um, I'll just wait until there are questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jeannie Collins. Very much appreciated. Emily Nisley from Superintendent from Orange East Supervisory Union. Welcome, Emily. And you have a you have a budget vote next week, don't you? We have a budget vote today. Oh, it's today. Yes. Right. So yes, I'm Emily Nisley. Um, thank you so much for having me. I serve as the superintendent of schools in Orange East Supervisory Union. Um, and I also serve as the trustee to the VSA for the Northeast Kingdom region of Vermont. Uh, Orange East serves the towns of Thetford, Corinth, Topsom, Bradford, Newberry, Wells River, Groton, and Rygate. We have four districts and seven schools, including a regional technical center and two high schools. Our communities have varying levels of economic need. Um, our free and reduced lunch rates are as low as 20% in Thetford and as high as 60% in many of our other buildings. COVID-19 has presented us with both many challenges and many successes. We celebrate our food program for feeding countless families, countless meals over the past 10 to 11 months. Our ability to offer both remote and in-person options to our families. The willingness of our staff to redesign educational delivery models for our students in all new ways. And we celebrate our ability to partner with Little Rivers Federal Healthcare Center to offer immunization clinics, on-site healthcare in our buildings, testing and response to COVID cases, as well as, many, as well as many mental health supports for students and families with no cost to our schools. We celebrate the dedication of our staff, our students and our families, and their patience and support and perseverance through this all. Um, and I certainly admire and thank them for that. Staffing shortages due to positive cases or quarantines have challenged us, uh, forcing us to shift from in-person to fully remote learning at times. We've been challenged by the demands put on school nurses and administrators. Um, we just had in one school, staff working on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to help contact trace positive cases in schools, as well as many weekends over the year. Um, and that's on top of, you know, their usual typical duties and, and late nights doing other things. Um, and I think in small schools, that's been a particular challenge because the bench of folks just isn't as deep as some of our larger buildings. We've had schools that have seen no cases at all and schools that have seen more than a dozen cases. Um, we've been challenged by the demands of teaching in a pandemic, social distancing, masks, administering diligent health and safety protocols, 
Um, and we've really changed so much of what we do in our schools. I think that that's a really important point to remember as we look towards recovery. But one thing that I think it's that's important for you to know is that we have done it all. And we've smiled through our masks and made our schools as safe as they can be and as welcoming for students as we can make them. But it has been a massive lift. And as we approach month 11 of navigating a pandemic, teachers, parents, staff, families are exhausted, plain and simple. And as the vaccine becomes more available, we are now working towards recovery. But it's going to take time for Vermont schools to come back to what I think we all know will be a new normal. As you may remember, one of the districts in my supervisory union, Oxbow Unified Union School District, is still without an operating budget for this school year. Today, fingers crossed, is our fourth vote. Um, it is January and we have no approved budget to operate the four schools in our care in that district. This causes stress for our faculty, stress for our staff who worry about their jobs, stress to a school board who has done amazing work to come together in really tough circumstances and they dedicate so much of their time and energy to the good work of trying to make this merger successful. Um, and all of that stress trickles down to students in the classroom and families in our towns who worry about stability. Our first budget vote was scheduled to take place from the floor in April in our traditional town meeting style. Uh, but due to the pandemic, we were forced to postpone that first vote. We then held a vote via Australian ballot in June, um, not our traditional method and not something that folks were used to. Um, this vote failed by 200 votes. The board worked to cut the budget, held a second vote in September, um, and this vote also failed with less than 15% of our voters turning out. The board cut the budget again, and we held a third vote in late November. It failed by only 15 votes with higher turnout than the vote before. And so the board made the decision to present the same budget that failed in November to the voters today, um, combined with a diligent and effort on the part of many to get folks out today and voting. Um, Oxbow Unified Union School District was created by order of the State Board of Education. Um, so it's what is referred to as a forced merger of the towns of Newberry and Bradford. On top of this district being merged, we also had another supervisory district merged into our SU at the same time. So that we've gone through both a district merger and an SU merger, and that has meant a lot of change has come quickly, um, most of which has not been voluntary or welcome. There's strong anti-merger sentiment. Um, there's belief that the issue is too big, that local control has been stripped back and placed in the hands of a regional school board, administrators, and an SU board, and people don't like that feeling. Excuse me. <laughs> On December 29th, the town of Newberry held a vote to leave the merged district. The vote to leave, surprisingly, did not pass. Um, this is a real positive for us and the new district and the new board, but there's still a lot of work to do. The lack of budget and the upheaval by, caused by COVID, I think, made many people reluctant to add more stress, stress to the system. And I think that that influenced the votes of many folks in our towns. Um, but despite the anti-merger sentiment, the new district has brought increased sharing of resources, greater collaboration among the board and the boards in the SU, um, greater collaboration among teachers and administrators across the schools, and a popular school choice program amongst families. Teachers have moved from not supporting the merger to seeing the advantages of collaboration and shared resources in their work, which has been a, a very important shift. Um, lastly, one thing I think that's important to, to know in terms of the context of all of this is that COVID has really made the work 
of mergers more challenging. Um, due to the health regulations that are in place that are very important, we can't invite parents and community into our school buildings. We can't gather in public spaces and work through concerns. We can't hold meetings from our school gymnasiums and cafeterias and sit with our neighbors to work through a budget vote. We can't have coffee hours or pancake breakfasts to talk about budgets. And this has increased the feeling that local connections are being lost due to Act 46 mergers. Um, and some of that really is, is COVID. So Zoom meetings have been really well attended, but it's not the same as sitting with your community in the same space and engaging in civil discourse. Vermonters expect that kind of interaction, we all know that, with their schools and their government, and we need time to be able to get past these logistical challenges before we undo the mergers that have already taken place. As you navigate the challenges of the session, I would ask that you just keep those factors in mind. We have already changed the structure of these school districts, the way in which they vote, the manner in which they interact with their community, and the way that they educate their students. And we really need time to work on being connected again in real human ways beyond screens um, before we focus on shifting our governance work again. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Emily, and I wish you well on your, your vote today. We'll be watching. Um, Peter Burroughs, superintendent from Addison Central School District. Welcome, Hi. Peter Burroughs. Hi, thank you. So um, yeah, I, I would echo a lot of what Emily has said, and I think what I'll share is similar. Um, I wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to provide this testimony today, uh, to share the work that's happening in Addison Central School District and throughout the state as we navigate the many forces that are coming to bear on education this school year. I wanted to start by sharing how grateful the entire field is of the work that our legislators are doing to support Vermont schools, given the myriad of challenges and pressures that we're facing, facing both as a state and as a country. So thank you so much, all of you, for the work that you're doing. And I do wish we were all together right now and not on Zoom. Uh, I will, I definitely feel that too. Um, so Addison Central is comprised of seven towns in Addison County, Bridport, Cornwall, Middlebury, Ripton, Salisbury, Shoreham, and Weybridge. Um, our communities have a strong history of supporting schools. Um, we voted to become a unified district in 2016. And through strong collaboration and systems-driven work, we've accomplished a lot um, during this time together. Um, and, and accomplished a lot that we couldn't have accomplished as a supervisory union. Um, there are lots of examples of the impact of being a unified district has had um, for our students. Um, one is becoming an international baccalaureate world district mm -hmm. to prepare students to be reflective and principled in a world that is increasingly global. Uh, we've made changes to many of our systems. We've become more efficient um, to serve students. And I, I think the biggest impact has been the ability to develop a singular vision and, and lean in and, and begin to tackle some of the demographic and physical challenges that we're facing um, today. Financially, um, and we're just, we just adopted our budget on Monday night, um, the board adopted the budget. Um, we are now in a, in a somewhat challenging position where um, the, the lines between our, our per people costs and the excess spending threshold have crossed. And this year we find our per pupil cost is $500,000, roughly $500,000 over the excess spending threshold. Um, prior to unification, only one of our eight former districts, we were eight districts previously, um, had decided to spend over the excess spending threshold. And a tension that we are currently feeling in our district is balancing our, our spending and, and, and how much we're willing to spend um, with the tax burden we believe our community can sustain. The ACSD board has been engaged in a facilities master plan over the last four years to work to build a long range vision for spending and determine how uh, we keep all the valuable resources in all of our schools. This work has ranged from looking at facilities investment in our schools to a lengthy elementary study to consider consolidating resources in fewer schools to increase student access to those resources. 
The impact of cutting resources every year to stay below the excess spending threshold to avoid double taxation will continue to diminish supports for all students. The tension between keeping town elementary schools and diminishing resources is our greatest challenge. Um, as you may know, yesterday there was a vote to secede by two towns in our district, Ripton and Weybridge. The proposal to secede in Ripton was approved. Uh, the proposal to secede in Weybridge was rejected. The board has recently postponed a final decision on school consolidation until June uh, to provide more time to engage with our community and work to make a decision together that feels most right for our students. Um, you know, I would, I would also say that um, to add to that, that uh, it is challenging to, to do this work by Zoom and, and not be together. And I think um, one of, the, one of the, the challenges of the timing and now being over the threshold is um, this work um, has a certain kind of time pressure to it in that, um, you know, our pred predictions for FY23 are, are seeing that that overage and this threshold going up potentially by another million dollars. So um, we, we both want to, to come back together and do this work physically as a community, um, not, not on Zoom, but um, COVID has made that pretty challenging. Um, this work has also brought into high relief the need to designate funds for critical school capital construction needs across the state. Um, as I mentioned, we've spent four years looking at our um, our facilities and our, our infrastructure. Schools in ACSD are in dire need of investment as are others throughout Vermont. And we have not had state support for capital investment for many years. As local tax burdens continue to rise, I believe it's imperative that the General Assembly returns to its study of school construction aid. Capital investment cannot continue to be delayed given the state's aging school infrastructure. Following the example of other states throughout the country, a thorough assessment and plan for investment should be made so that local districts are not left with this responsibility alone, a responsibility they can't fund. And I think we've seen that. Uh, we saw that last year. We saw a number of big bonds in the state, um, big and smaller bonds, and uh, many of them went down. And I think uh, there's a lot of concern among superintendents across the state. I've talked to, to many who, are, are wondering what their next step is because they don't feel that the, their communities can, can support a, a big bond, but the need is there. So um, it's a place that I think we're really asking the state to, to take a lead and, and support local schools. COVID-19 has impacted our entire system as it has to others. Um, what struck me most about the impact of the pandemic on our district is both how much it's brought us all together and how much we've needed each other as the level of stress and anxiety people feel has become part of our new normal within the pandemic. We've dealt with innumerable challenges over the last year and our community has been incredibly flexible in adapting to the shifting realities of health and safety guidance and the services we're able to provide within this context. Again, I appreciate the work the House Education Committee has done for the students of Vermont. I look forward to working alongside all of you as we make our way out of the pandemic and continue, continue to build on the strengths of Vermont's education system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jeff Francis, I assume that you are sort of uh, bringing these um, requests together in a form that we can take a look at um, some of the requests that are coming forward. Thank you, I figured. <laughs> um, and last is Julie Reg Regenball um, from the Missisquoi Valley School District. So. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for having all of us here to speak with you to this morning. As you said, I'm Julie Regenball, and I'm currently in my third year serving as superintendent of the Missisquoi Valley School District, or MVSD. Um, we were one of the last, like Emily, one of the last round of school districts that was merged through State Board of Ed Directive and we came to into existence just July 1st of 2019. It was very unpopular here as well, um, though we have had a very smooth and successful first year and a half. Um, our district comprises the towns of Franklin, Highgate, and Swanton. We have approximately 1,800 students and they attend three pre-K through sixth grade schools 
and then attend uh, 7th through 12th grade at MVU Middle and High School. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the experiences of our teachers, administrators, and in our community members through this pandemic. I have to say, last March, the move to close schools and educate students remotely was just a huge challenge. However, I have to credit our our, our community, our teachers, everyone, it has gone so well and people have had such a good spirit about facing this challenge together. A great example of this is last spring, our food service and how are we gonna feed our families it was a problem that we solved together. Our food service team, our bus companies, our teachers, they just worked as a well-oiled machine and uh, working out of our high school, we delivered 186,675 meals to students between March 23rd and June 15th. I mean, that is just a Herculean task. And it couldn't have been done without a huge support from our teachers and the teachers union. And the just sort of, we're all in this together, all hands on deck spirit. And that has really helped us through this whole pandemic. Now we've moved away from delivering meals once summer began um, and we began transporting students at the opening of school. And so families had to come and pick up meals. What we found is that was harder. So we actually moved to creating meal boxes and those boxes can be picked up a day a week. And instead of prepared meals, there are ingredients and recipes for families to make meals together at their home. And that has been very popular and has really increased our participation. I mentioned these numbers and this emphasis on feeding our families because we just know that in Franklin County, as well as other parts of Vermont, there are just so many families for whom food insecurity is a daily issue. And we appreciate the focus from the state and the federal government on prioritizing feeding our, feeding our students. Currently on our return to school, um, we have a combination of in-person and hybrid models going on in our district. Franklin Central School and Highgate Elementary School students are learning in person five days a week in grades K through six. Our Swanton Elementary students are learning in person five days a week in K-5 and hybrid in sixth grade. Uh, we have some staffing issues and it's a larger school with larger numbers of students. It's hard to fit them all in the space. So unfortunately, the sixth grade there is still hybrid. Our middle and high school students in seven through 12 are all hybrid. They're educated in person two days a week and remotely three days a week. I have to say, we've also partnered with our Swanton Rec Department. They uh, are a childcare hub for us and they are serving remote students in sixth uh, through eighth grade um, in all three of our towns who want to join as well as the students <clears throat> who have chosen a 100% remote option that are just missing that social connection or they feel that you know somebody else besides their families need to help them and support them through their, their work. So that partnership has worked really well. As I mentioned, we did offer a 100% remote option for those who really wanted um, to learn remotely uh, <clears throat> instead of send their child to school. We had 160 students who chose that, and we partnered with Vermont VTVLC, Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative or Cooperative. Um, that's definitely caused some challenges, and, and part of our staffing challenges in schools like Swanton uh, are directly related to the number of students who wanted to go remotely, and we had to give teachers to that program. But uh, overall, really, we, we it was a tough, piece of work to do both things. But we were able to balance it well. And I think that most students got the model that they needed for their students and their family. And so to us, that's the most important piece. One of the opportunities or really just lucky serendipitous pieces of the work we were doing before the pandemic hit and it helped us sustain through so far this pandemic is the work we were doing in social emotional learning in our district. 
So we knew that as kids were coming back to school, we were gonna to have to focus pretty heavily on the social emotional learning needs of our students. And we were lucky because we spent last school year developing a set of social emotional learning competencies um, with a, a real multidisciplinary team of teachers and staff and the support of uh, the Collaborative for Social Emotional Learning or CASEL. This work continued even after the closure of schools last March. And the competencies gave teachers the tools they needed to embed evidence-based practices to support students' emotional well-being. Now, it, it was lucky because we needed it so much with the pandemic, but the work had already started. And it was amazing the, the commitment that our teachers had to finishing that work. What we know about SEL and social emotional learning is that a student's ability to regulate themselves and attend to the feelings of others is a prerequisite for success in school and in life. And this year being so extraordinary, it was all the more urgent that we treat students SEL social emotional functioning through a learning lens rather than a deficit or disciplinary lens. The urgency of the COVID pandemic coupled with the availability of this new district curriculum created an opportunity really for us to dive in and really change the culture and attitudes about students who struggle with their emotional well-being. So that was one of the positive outcomes for us. The biggest challenge though just by far that we face in this pandemic is the unequal access that students have had to high quality instruction, despite honestly the very best efforts of our talented educators. Teachers have put into place some really very rigorous learning experiences for students, yet in the end we have more children who are not attending or are attending infrequently. We have students with special needs, for whom learning remotely is just ineffective. Regardless of the good plans put in place, we know that the long-term effects of COVID-19 could be significant, particularly for children who already experience an achievement gap. This leads me really to discuss our current and future hopes for the delivery of special education. As a former special ed director and member of the special ed advisory panel, I really believe what we do now in response to this learning crisis could either marginalize large groups of students or it could redesign a more responsive and effective system for struggling learners. In Vermont, we're unique in how we have defined what special education is. The delivery system has been built on a definition of special ed that requires services above and beyond those offered in the regular education system of supports. This has created a model that requires children's needs to be diagnosed and labeled before they can get more. It has not only pathologized the learning differences of students, created a culture of more is better and it's also resulted in marginalizing students from their classroom teachers. Some of those practices have been really obvious. The overuse of pullout services, the over-reliance on paraeducators, for example. But other practices have been more subtle, but are still very damaging to student outcomes, both individual outcomes and, and systemically the outcomes for our students. When we define special, as something other than the classroom teacher, we defer responsibility to someone else for that student's success. The district management group highlighted this in their report where most classroom teachers reported feeling underqualified to teach struggling readers. The result is that Vermont lags in closing the achievement gap and we over identify some groups of students as needing special education. Act 173 in part was designed to break this system. The change in who funds services can change who delivers them. The proposed special education rules reflects a change in the definition of special education that will remove that above and beyond language and should allow us to put the best teacher in front of the neediest student. 
hopefully we can do that with less labeling of students. For Act 173 to be successful, we need to ensure that we redesign our systems in a way that optimizes staff and their experience. You put that best reading teacher in front of the neediest student rather than a special educator who just got out of school. We refrain, pardon me, we retrain and reshape the culture that our general education system and teachers have so that they understand their central role in reaching students with learning and social emotional challenges. There's a mindset that really needs to change. We also have to train our teachers in the instructional practices they need to be the experts in teaching literacy and mathematics to students who struggle to learn. We have to ensure that the regulations and the interpretation of those regulations by the Agency of Education support a model that keeps high quality instruction as close to the classroom as possible, rather than create layers that remove students and frankly only serve to sift and sort children, often along socioeconomic and cultural lines. We have an opportunity to truly use Act 173 in a revolutionary way that will help close learning gaps. It is my hope that the urgency of the pandemic recovery will force systems to redesign how we educate struggling learners. If so, Vermont can have a system that focuses more on instruction than it does on identification. And that will be good for all of our children. Thank you again for the opportunity to share not only our experiences during the COVID time, but also our worries and hopes for public education during this recovery period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, offer some uh, time for our committee members uh, that have questions of the superintendents. We have until we have about another half an hour, um, a little less than a half an hour, and then we'll take a 15 minute break and have the principals come in. Um, but th this is it's very helpful. And some of the things that I'm hearing you talk about are already uh, bills we're expecting into the committee, as well as things that we may be taking up anyway. Representative Conlon. Uh, good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for some very powerful testimony. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of big picture um, thoughts that you shared with us. I actually have a couple of kind of specific questions. Um, uh, Dave Younds talked about the, the need to, to give schools time and space, no new initiatives. Um, I guess I, I'd ask you and then everybody else can sort of nod their heads, uh, yes or no. Um, but that is, would, would one of the ways we could give you some time and space would be to uh, pause the implementation of e-finance? That is a fantastic question, Representative Conlon. Um, I think pausing the implementation would be a wise strategic move. And in the field, um, others might have various in interest in reviewing the product in and of itself. The, we do experience challenges with e-finance being able to meet the needs of school districts and even meet the needs of the auditors who are you know, looking to analyze our spending and, and make sure that we're following all the rules that we need to. So e-finance does need to be looked at and a pause would be a great first move. My other question, um, anybody else can uh, jump in on this obviously. Uh, it, there was a lot of use of the Vermont Cooperative Learning Collaborative. I'm not sure if that's the right name for it. But I'm just curious to know um, how that worked and, and what you see as its future uh, once we get beyond the pandemic. Representative Conlon, I, we in my district don't have any experience with VTVLC. Do any of my colleagues, uh, anyone have anything we, to speak to? We do not beyond what existed before the pandemic. We did not sign on during the pandemic, so I don't really have a response to that. Really? Yeah, we chose to go with VTVLC rather than develop our own program. And there's pros and cons with it. I mean, they had to scale up an unprecedented number of students enrolling. And it's like running a school that you don't have control over. So it's a little bit of a challenge there. I think the biggest challenge was the amount of work that our administrative team had to be involved in meetings and problem solving 
uh, and that continues. That was unknown to us. But our many of our students are very well served by it, particularly older students. It gives them some options, and there are, there's aspects of it that um, maybe we'll be keeping for some of our students, so they can have some some offerings that we don't have in our high school. What was tough though was younger family families of younger children who were afraid of of COVID and didn't want in person learning, but chose this and then realized it wasn't really a fit for a second grader. Um, as it, the teacher's doing a fabulous job, but it's just different teaching a second grader than a ninth grader remotely. And some of those students wanted to come back, but we had to give our teachers away. So every 20 students that enrolled, we needed to give a teacher. So that meant redesigning our classrooms. And then we had space, you know, requirements that only allowed so many children per classroom. So that became a real burden. And as children wanted to come back, honestly, it's public school. You can't say we're, we're full, but uh, that was a pressure that we had to work through and we had to be pretty darn creative to make things happen for kids, but that's unique circumstances. Jesse, could you please put on our list um, the Vermont Virtual Learning Co uh, Cooperative for us to have a moment to chat about at some point? Um, Peter Burroughs and then and then Jeannie Collins. Yeah, I was just going to add. Um, you know, we we've, we've started to try to map out our recovery plan in ACSD to look at you know kind of thinking through this year and and expecting that next year we won't necessarily be back to quote unquote normal, but. Um, you know, trying to take some of what we've learned from the pandemic and, and start to, to structure how we're going to return. And, and I think virtual learning is one of the things that we were talking about wondering, um, you know, how does that fit in to, you know, let's assume everyone's vaccinated, we're back to normal. How does virtual learning fit in based on what we've learned thus far? So I think, I guess I would say that I think a lot of districts are going to be um, you know, over the next six months to a year, looking at that and, and considering how does virtual learning fit within in a different way from the way it did previously? How does it fit in based on what we've learned, both with VTVLC and as Jeannie mentioned, um, a number of folks have their own remote academies or they have virtual learning connected to a, a classroom now. That's work that I think the field um, needs to do and it goes alongside the other ahas that we've experienced over the last 10 months in, in seeing that some of what we were doing before wasn't working and this is an opportunity to, to start to shift things. Thank you. Um, Representative Brown. Thank you. Um, Ms. Nisley from the Orange East Supervisory Union had mentioned that her school district had been um, partnering with local health and mental health providers around supporting families. And I was just curious if she could say a little bit more about how, what, what that partnership looked like. Yes, so we partner with Little Rivers, which is a, a federal health care center. Um, and pre-COVID, so maybe four, five or six years ago, we began this down the road of this partnership. And we actually went through the process with a lot of guidance from Little Rivers who have been wonderful partners to, to go through the process of making our school buildings into federal healthcare center sites. So we went through the federal process to get that approved. Um, in doing that, that means that we can have staff from Little Rivers working in our, our school buildings um, at no cost to us other than giving them an, an office space or a, a, a spot to sit. Um, and they're able to work with students. That does mean that they need to enroll them as patients, um, but there is flexibility in the rules that you know, if they have a couple of patients, let's say in a, in a social skills group, they can serve eight students who don't necessarily have to be their patients. Um, and we started small in one school and we've expanded over the course of the past couple of years. And I think because that foundation was already there, the work became, began in, in mental health support and behavioral support, but because those foundations were already there, when COVID hit, we looked to them, quite frankly, for their medical expertise 
um, and began to expand what other pieces we could do in our schools. Um, and so we now have one of our school buildings has a clinic and a physician is, is there. Um, we're in the planning stages now for once they have vaccines, how we're gonna distribute those and use the schools to do that. Um, we had a, a, for lack of a better word, a run of cases in one of the school building. They came, I called and they came in and tested anyone for COVID who wanted to be tested. So it's been really wonderful. Um, and it's expanded services to our families and hasn't added to our per pupil costs Thank and you. has helped them bring in revenue in rural healthcare. Thank you. Excuse me, um, Jeannie Collins, you were gonna speak on uh, Vermont uh, Virtual Learning Cooperative. Thank you. I just wanted to reinforce a point I made earlier that uh, for remote learning to continue, whether it's VTV, LC expanded, or whether it's districts providing their own, there needs to be internet access. I neglected to say that in the spring, 25% of my families and 10% of my staff could not access the internet from their home. And they sat in our school parking lots to access it. Um, with the hotspots, we've improved that. But if we can improve that with hotspots, I think that the state of Vermont can improve that for everybody. So you can't have one without the other. Yes, last year we actually heard from teachers parked outside of their school districts trying to deliver, you know, service, <laughs> services from their cars. So, um, wait a minute, I've lost my hands. Let's see. I, I, Representative James and then Representative Austin. Representative James, did your question get answered? It did. Thank you. I was also curious about the community school aspect um, of integrating health and uh, mental health. So, thank you. Interesting conversation. Representative Austin, then Representative Coopley. Yes. Hi, thank you. And I just want to extend my gratitude, not only, not only as a legislator, but as a citizen. I think you made it look too easy um, in terms of uh, how you pivoted. And I think it, if you're in education, you realize how difficult that was and complicated. So I really appreciate the work you did. Um, I have one quest I have two questions. One is about something Julie mentioned in terms of the learning. And I'm wondering, I'll ask my two questions and um, maybe Jeff can answer at some point, but I'm wondering if you are thinking at all with funding, uh, if we could use some of the CRF funding or that we're getting, if you have considered summer, using summer as a time possibly for remedial work for the students that have really fell behind in their skills and knowledge. So that's one question. And the other question is, I think one thing that COVID did was put a huge spotlight on the role that schools play in terms of childcare and the economy and making it possible for working parents to work. Um, and I think that's a huge shift. I think people really never thought about that role of schools that without children going to schools, people couldn't go to work and the economy couldn't grow and I can't grow. And I just was wondering, you know, at some point, maybe not now, because that's, that's an interesting subject, but if we could look at that um, in terms of a shift on how the public sees public schools in their roles of feeding kids and uh, taking care of kids so parents can go to work as well as teaching them, you know, skills and knowledge. So one on one on on um, summer and here on the role of school as childcare. Thank you, um, Gina Collins. You had a response. Um, summer, we are thinking about that. We haven't fully decided because, to be honest, our staff also needs a break. They worked through last summer, so we haven't figured that out completely yet. But we are looking at uh, credit recovery and and some remedial learning time. But the other point I really wanted to speak to, um, yes, I think that the spotlight really was shown on the schools. And I, I think even so, it's only part of a spotlight. So the schools do provide childcare. We provide after school programs. I think it was Julie or Emily spoke about um, the food programs. I didn't mention that, but we were feeding, we were giving out 750 meals a day in the spring. Um, we're still doing about 300 meals a day that we're delivering home when kids are not actually in school. Um, so we provide food, we provide mental health, as Julie explained, and or again, I forget who explained um, the integrated services with health. And, and we, I also had a healthcare center in my previous district. Uh, we're providing healthcare services. 
through nursing, we're providing mental health services, we're providing food services, childcare services, and, and teaching. So if there's a way that we could spotlight all of that, I, I would be all for it. Thank you. Um, anybody else on that one? Uh, David Yance? Yes, thank you. Um, on the second question, kind of the, the how do we how do we serve the community better? There was a piece this morning, I'm not an expert on this, but I read a piece just before this meeting in VT Digger by Bill Schubart, and he was talking about reimagining community schools. Uh, it was an intriguing piece, talked about in his language, you know, funneling money upstream, meaning down to the younger age children, and seeing the benefits of that long term while also maintaining the importance and the value of especially small elementary schools in smaller communities. My initial reaction to that, this is off the cuff, so please bear with me. My initial reaction to that was, hey, as a superintendent, I can speak for my colleagues and say, we love dreaming about those types of things. We love thinking outside the box and, and creating solutions. But first, how do we fund that? And how do we fund that in a way that doesn't um, require more money than we currently pull from taxpayers to fund? That would be an interesting challenge to face. Then how do you staff that in a, in a state where we do struggle with some of the infrastructure dynamics that modern society expects in terms of people having access to work and childcare, et cetera. So how do you get the folks to occupy the roles? And then how long would it take to see the positive impacts of that? You know, how long do you um, view an investment at one level that has a, a trickle down dynamic? How long does it take to see the results that you're looking for? And, and that, that's just bouncing around my head as we're speaking here this morning. So exciting opportunities, maybe necessary opportunities, but things that will require um, money, people, and time in order to, to find success. Thanks for asking that. Role of schools has changed a bit since most of us were students. Um, let's see, I think it was Representative Cooperly and then Representative Arison. You? I'm you. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and welcome, superintendents. Nice to see Rutland County well represented. Um, I, Julie, I have. Um, some concerns you you have mentioned special education issues or whatever i my concern is where are we going to find special education teachers and you have made a comment about putting a first year graduate or someone in in a classroom um, with special needs children or children that do need those supports um, how are you dealing with that up there uh, in terms of recruiting? Oh boy, that's a very good question. Um, in my former job, that was a big part of what I did is trying to attract teachers up to Franklin County. Um, and when we get new teachers from graduate programs in, in Vermont, they're, they're, they're trained as generalists. Right, so they learn a little bit about special ed, they learn about the law, they learn about the process. They don't have, they're not master teachers. So they know how to find out about a student and their disability, and, and, but they're not trained to be expert reading specialists or expert math teachers. Um, and so we can't expect them to be everything. By the time, if you have a good special educator and you train them and you keep them and you give them those opportunities, then wow, you've got something powerful and they work collaboratively with their veteran teachers around them. When you're in Franklin County, Lamoille County, you know, more rural parts of the state, we train those folks and then they go somewhere else. <laughs> often with their good experience. Uh, and that's a challenge that we have. And then that can affect your whole program and how, how sustainable, how, you know, if I'm a, a science teacher at a high school and I have a new special ed person every year or two, I don't build my own skills. I don't build those, you know, so it's a big challenge. It's not so much that we aren't getting folks trained and out there in the field. We are, but they don't necessarily stay and they don't come with the expertise that a classroom teacher or content area teacher has 
who's been teaching reading or English at language arts for 15 years. Those are the teachers we need to train because they're not going anywhere, right? And so we really need to focus on the partnership between a special educator that may be newer and the classroom teacher who has a lot of expertise in how to teach and they should learn from one another. Thank you. Yeah, I was gonna ask if there's anyone else who would like to join in on that particular conversation. Peter? Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, the way I think kind of connected to this in thinking about recovery and, and special ed and, and um, Act 173, I think we find ourselves with COVID-19 in an unusual situation where due to the, the learning gaps that are forming or that have been forming over the last 10 months, I just read uh, a research article where, where someone actually quantitatively looked at where the learning loss has happened over the last 10 months and it was pretty significant and is impacting our um, students living in poverty much more significantly than, than others from um, wealthier families. So that's a huge concern. And historically, those challenges tend to fall to special ed. As Julie mentioned, it tends to leave the general ed classroom and moves over to special ed. And then it, it becomes challenging for us to have a, a comprehensive approach, which is, I think, what X 173 is about. So I, I think, uh, you know, as we plan for coming out of COVID-19 and supporting all students and, and really leaning into those learning gaps, um, we can't, it can't be just special ed that's carrying this. It's going to have to be our entire teaching and learning framework that pivots in a way that it never has had to before because we find ourselves in a place we've never been. I, I think Thank it, you. If, it, if it gives folks some, some hope, I, I do believe we are going to be looking at uh, the DMG report from, uh, from Act 173 looking at relating that to learning loss that is uh, brought to us by COVID and perhaps the ability to use some federal funds to help with that implementation. That's a current conversation that, that some of us have been having as a way to actually move that forward. Um, Representative Arison, we've got, I, I, we've got about five more minutes. I'll let it go 10, but I wanna make sure we've got a 10 minute break in between. So Representative Arison, please. Thank you very much. A uh, general question to all the superintendents. Uh, at our local level, we're seeing the school budgets uh, trending. Uh, they're still passing, but they're trending to a point where we're concerned they're not going to pass. And what my question is whether or not we're seeing that trend across the state. And another area that our local board has shown concern with is um, we have a vote at the SU level from our representative, but if the local budget fails, the SU budget has been fixed and doesn't, you can't really touch it. Uh, somebody could address that. Um, uh, David Yance, please. Great question, Representative Arison. Thanks for asking it. Uh, yes, so this is year seven for me in my role, and I would suggest that over the previous six years, I've seen those budget votes getting closer and closer on the yeses and nos, and I think that's a, a trend that um, many of my colleagues are seeing statewide. I will say as a, we've been operational as a unified district. This is our fourth or fifth year now. It's been so long I've lost track, but uh, 2016 of July, July of 2016, we went live. And um, I do not miss the scenario where we were preparing an SU budget that was in fact a fixed um, number that the community had very little control over and that it was the, the local school-based budget that was the variable that, that the town voted on. So I suspect that's still the case. Um, my, my colleague Jeannie is, uh, is still in an SU context and, and might have some, some feedback on that as well. Jeannie? Um. <laughs> I, I also see the trend getting tighter and tighter. I also think that this year is going to blow us all out of the water because there are so many other factors that we're facing as 
despite keeping schools open, people are not able to work and don't have money for taxes, and yet it does cost to run the schools. And um, you know, I, I, I think this particular year isn't necessarily part of that trend. This particular year is going to reflect the pandemic. Um, there is there is talk in, in my Outer Valley community about wanting to know the cost of running each school and still having difficulty understanding that they're running an, uh, a, an entire district. And you can't really tease out the cost of a school by school anymore because your staffing is district staff, not, not school by school staff. You can to some extent, but it's hard to explain how that plays out. I know that people show up at budget discussions only if their particular town school is affected in it. Um, and, and, um, and yet at the same time, being able to budget for an entire district allows me to retain staff that I otherwise would have let go of as we were right sizing and letting go of a number of staff. It allows me to um, therefore retain my investment in that staff and save money for the district. But it's, we're still very much in a transition communication phase with that. It's, I don't have a direct answer. That's just some information for you. Thank you. This has been um, very helpful. I'm wondering if um, Jeff Francis or Chelsea Myers from the uh, from the Superintendents Association have any. Oh, and that, there's also Emily. I want to just maybe get Emily first, and then uh, Je Chelsea, Chelsea, and Jeff. If you have something to to close with, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, just very briefly. I I can comment. That certainly has been a factor in our budget struggle in terms of being able to pass the budget that we're still waiting on. Um, and some of that, you know, if those budgets go down earlier in the season, we have certainly returned to the table at the SU board and made adjustments. Um, we continue to try to operate under a spending freeze at the SU except for COVID essentials just to keep costs as low as possible. But again, you know, one of the challenges in our issue is that we have some budgets that are voted on at town meeting and we have some vo budgets that are voted on in May. If a budget fails in May, we've already contracted a fair number of that issue staff for the next year. So it, it makes any adjustments harder. If those budgets go down at town meeting day, there's certainly more flexibility for that SU board to return to the table and make adjustments if they need to. But we certainly set our SU budget earlier in the game than that. So people have those those numbers for their votes. But it is a, it has been a factor for us. And one of the benefits, again, of of supervisory districts instead of supervisory unions, obviously, is that it's one budget and the voters do have a say in those district level things in a more active way than they do with an issue. At some point, not now, I would be interested in your thoughts on um, why some budgets are voted so late in the year. And if there is something that that is something that should be considered when you have access to, to your, to your, uh, to your town support. Um, Jeff and Chelsea. Their view. Uh, thank you, Chair Chair Webb. On the question of SUs versus SDs, one of the underlying principles of Act 46 was more equitable opportunity for kids and better utilization of resources. So despite the fact that we have some supervisory unions uh, continuing to exist in Vermont, and that was thought through, it is not the, it's, you know, I'll tell you from my observation and superintendents will attest that SQs are not a more efficient delivery uh, structure than single school districts. And that's something that the General Assembly should keep in mind as you consider anything more relative to Act 46. With regard to the testimony this morning, um, I'm pleased with the group that we reached out to because you got a very, very good representative sample of what's going on. I think I speak for Chelsea when I say that we're proud of our association with these folks 
um, we're eager to hear testimony from the other uh, participants in the education delivery system and throughout your journey through the rest of this session, Chelsea and I are going to be available to you to support and inform the work of your committee. We can bring witnesses um, to you on practically any area of interest. Um, to echo Dave Younce's opening comments, space and time in terms of the pandemic recovery are very important. I think that there are very, very big issues like um, internet connectivity and broadband, learning recovery, and capital construction aid for schools that we want to see the General Assembly pursue in earnest. Um, we're hoping that there are no new initiatives per se of a programmatic nature. I think that there'll be time for that in the future. But there are a lot of lessons learned coming out of COVID, and most of them reiterate the, um, the, the, the legislation that was introduced um, in the years preceding, introduced and approved in the years preceding COVID, um, Act 173, Act 46. So we, we are and we're on the right course and I think we need to get back on course. Um, but it's a pleasure to be with you today, and and um, and I'm happy to be here with these superintendents. And I'm uh, wondering if Chelsea has anything she wants to add. She's a great asset to our association and is familiar, and will be familiar to the committee as well. Thank you, Chelsea, about one minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, just quickly, um, Chelsea Myers, VSA Associate Executive Director. Um, something that was not raised was that superintendents are also contending with um, efforts to increase anti-racism in schools um, and promote equity and also contending with a lot of civic unrest. And that's something that on top of this layered pandemic they are contending with each day and some communities are more ready to tackle that than others. And it's a topic that you might want to consider listening to um, practitioners about in the future. Thank you, I do expect some bills and I also am getting questions about media literacy after seeing the storming of the Capitol where people are getting information. So I wanna give uh, committee members 10 minute break. Um, I thank you so much. Um, I, we will be keeping um, Jeff and Chelsea uh, apprised and uh, connected to our committee. So if you can, you can sort of work through them, uh, that makes things a little bit easier for us. Um, and with that, what I want to do is say we're going to be offline. You're more than welcome um, to participate or to, or to watch, I guess, on, on YouTube, our conversation with, this, with the principals. And um, so with that, I will go offline for now and I will see the committee in 10 minutes.